Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 22. The title of today's message is Invited. In Matthew 22, Jesus reveals a parable where he describes a king inviting his subjects to enjoy the best of what he has. There's a marriage feast, and he wants all to come. And so his invitation goes out. We're going to pick up the text in verse 1 of chapter 22 of Matthew. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been called to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. That is a surprising statement. A king asks for your presence, you go. Especially for a party. I mean, who would miss that? But they are, surprisingly, they don't want to go. Verse Four, again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been called, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. This is even more astonishing. They are not only indifferent in some aspects to the invitation, they don't want to come. Some of them are antagonistic, rebellious against it. No, you're my subjects, come to the party, come. And it, no. And then they kill his slaves. Verse 7, but the king was enraged, as you would expect, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were called were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, call to the wedding feast. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. That last verse, verse 14, is the main point of today's sermon. On this invitation, many are called. God reaches out all day long to people, inviting them, come, come, come. Experience that which is good. Experience all that I have prepared for you. And some will reject it. Some will be antagonistic against it. And some will come. Some will be, become, be compelled to come. The king's servants will draw them in and they will go. Much could be said about this parable. I'm going to forego all of that because I want the main point to resonate. Many are called. In, in the Greek, you could even read it, all are called. All of creation is calling out and describing of the glories of God. All are called, but only a few will come. Today, we are going to be in Psalm 34, and we're going to delight ourselves, be satisfied in the goodness of God. We are those who have heard the call, 
who have heard the invitation, who have experienced the delights of the Lord, have tasted and seen that he is good, and we're going to ruminate on that. We're going to enjoy what he has done for us. Let's open in prayer. Lord God, we know that you are good. You are gentle. You are compassionate. And yet you will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Those that hate you and reject you will receive what their rebellion requires. But Lord, we are so grateful that you have been gracious toward us. We were no better than these, and yet you have compelled us, you have called us, you have changed our mind. We have your word before us today. Cut us to the quick. Gouge us where it's necessary. Help us to understand and see what you have for us. May we change, may we grow, may we develop in our understanding of you, and may our delight exceed all of our expectations. Let us, like David, be satisfied in you. We thank you and praise you, and we do so in the name of your Son, the Christ. Amen. I'll turn with you, if you would, to Psalm 34. I hope you had a chance to read this psalm. Sorry, this is quite a bit louder. Dad, maybe we can turn this off. Mute it. There we go. Is that better? It sounds better to me. Does that sound better to you? Okay. We're going to be in Psalm 34 today. And before we jump into the text, I want to just throw out to us the context so we understand why David is exulting in the Lord. He is exulting in the Lord because the Lord has saved him. In 1 Samuel 21, David has been chased away by Saul. He has scrambled out of town. He has gone to the, the tabernacle to uh, get food for his soldiers, to get a weapon. And even there he sees enemies, Doeg the Edomite. He leaves. He is so desperate. He is so beyond safety that he runs to Gath. Now, if, if you're familiar with Samuel, you know that Goliath hailed from Gath. He goes, he is safer in the enemy's stronghold than at home. He flees to Achish, the king of Gath, for asylum. He thinks, well, maybe it's been a few years. Maybe he doesn't remember that I killed his uh, hero. Uh, perhaps they don't know me on sight. Well, in 1 Samuel 21, uh, Achish, or Abimelech, that's his title, like Pharaoh or king, Abimelech, uh, his servants say, this is the guy. This is the one they sing about. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Don't invite him in here. And when David hears that they know who he is, he he puts on a display. He calls to the Lord and he feigns madness. He starts drooling all over himself and scribbling on the walls. And, and the king is like, I got enough madmen. <laughs> Why'd you bring this guy to me? I don't want him. Kick him out. And David is saved. They should have eaten him alive. And they didn't. He was saved. He called out to the Lord. And we're going to see that. That's the context of this psalm. He has been saved from Saul. He's been saved from Doeg the Edomite. He's been saved from Achish. He has been saved. He has called out to the Lord over and over and over again. And he has been validated. His faith has been proven to be true. And so he exults in the Lord. He has experienced 
God's goodness. And so he pours out this invitation. Come, come, enjoy the Lord. I have seen the truth. I know he is good. You can have it too. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Psalm 34, I've broken it into six sections. They're all about three or four verses apiece. This first one is verses one through three. I've titled it, Join With Me in Praise. And I've kind of titled these sections as a, a kind of long run-on sentence. So the titles, as you look at them, as you write them down in your notes, uh, and you can take notes on the back of your, your bulletin, there's a long run-on sentence that strings together these themes that we're going to see in each of these nuggets, these, these smaller sections of the, the chapter. Join with me in praise, verses 1 through 3. He says, I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in Yahweh. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. You know, Matthew 12 34 says, out of a man's mouth pours the abundance of what comes out of his heart. <laughs> what is in David's heart? He is saying that he will praise the Lord continually at all times. That he will bless him. He will boast in the Lord. He will magnify the Lord. And when you magnify something, you make it bigger. That's what John the Baptist did. What did he say? He must increase and I must decrease. This isn't about David so much as it is about the Lord. That's why he's inviting people. Join with me. See what I have seen. Experience what I have experienced. And exalt his name together. Verses 4 through 7 is the next section. We read in verses 1 through 3, David's invitation, join with me in praise. Now in verses 4 through 7, he gives the why. Because Yahweh hears and saves. He's not indifferent. He's not impartial. He's not ignorant. He's not apart. He is imminent. He is close. And he hears when we cry out to him. Verse 4, I inquired of Yahweh and he answered me and delivered me from all that I dread. He delivered me from Saul. He delivered me from Thoeg the Edomite, from Achish. He delivered me from Goliath. He delivered me from the lion, from the bear. He can go on and on. He delivered him from Absalom. He delivered him from all of his enemies. I inquired of the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all that I dread. You will see that, that theme of deliverance and the comprehensiveness of it repeated throughout this text. You will see that he's been delivered, that he's been saved, that he's been rescued. And you hear over and over that repeated theme, all of my troubles, all that I dread, at all times, all my troubles, over and over and over. Because of this, you can imagine the excitement. It's pouring out of him. Read verse 5. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be humiliated. This poor man called out. And Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. David, I got to imagine as he's penning this, as he's ruminating on his rescue and how he has been delivered, how he's been saved. He's not morose. No, that would, be, that would be atypical. We would not expect that. He is joyful. He is blessing the Lord. He is praising him. He is inviting others to join with him. Christian, you have experienced 
the goodness of God. We of all people, especially in this time, have a reason to be joyful. We are not to be moping around, carrying around this depressed look on our face. We have hope. We have good news. We have a reason to delight in the Lord. He has proven himself good. You all are, at some level, evangelists. And we make pretty poor marketing agents when we wear a grumpy frown on our face and say, oh, the Lord is good. Well, yeah, right. How good is he? You're, you're always scowling. You don't smile. <laughs> I put that in your brain housing group so that uh, not to upset you, but to give you some perspective. You have been blessed. You have been redeemed. Your worst fears have been addressed and dealt with, and you've been redeemed. Not because you're great, but because God is great. You need to not focus inward, but focus on him and what he has done for you. David is radiant because he has experienced the goodness of the Lord. Moses was radiant when he came down from Mount Sinai and he communed with the Lord. If you are not radiant, if you are not burning up with joy, I would propose to you that maybe you need to experience the Lord more. Maybe you're starving yourself. Maybe you're not applying what you're reading to yourself. I would suggest that more time is needed. We all know where we fall short. God's word does a good job of calling that out, but giving us cause to rejoice. Because when we agree, when we repent, when we turn from sin, when we say, yes, Lord, you nailed me right where I needed it. I need, I need help. And he saves and he delivers. You have a reason to rejoice. He doesn't want to leave you in sin. That isn't, that isn't what you've been called to. You've been called to experience the goodness of God. How does he enable that to happen? Well, verse 7 says, The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Angels, and apparently there's a lot of them, are around us. They're here today. I don't quite understand all of that, but they are here, they're ministering, ministering servants, and 1 Corinthians, uh, I didn't write this reference down, so I apologize. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 10 or 1 Corinthians 11. They're here watching worship. They are in the presence of God. They are ministering servants, Hebrews 1, 4 tells us, sent to do the will of God. They are used of God to protect us. They are used of God to deliver us. We looked at, Peter, uh, at David, but also Peter was saved from prison by an angel. They look after our spiritual welfare. They rejoice when we're converted. They watch over our lives, and when our lives are finished, they carry us to paradise. God has so loved us that he has sent ministering spirits angels to help us. He is withholding no good thing from us. As he protected David, as he delivered Peter, as he delivered Daniel from the lion's den, as he delivered his own son from temptation and had uh, ministering angels guard him and protect him, he will guard and protect us as well and rescue us. He is not withholding any good thing. So take joy in that. Well, verses one through three, David invited everyone to join with him in praise. 
The reason why was given in verses 4 through 7, because Yahweh hears and saves. Verses 8 through 10, you too can experience Yahweh's goodness. Verse 8, oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, Fear Yahweh, you his saints, for there is no want to those who fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who inquire of Yahweh shall not be in want of any good thing. You'll notice the repetition of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a right understanding of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the basis of of understanding. It's the basis of wisdom. It's the basis of knowledge. When you have a right perspective of God and a right perspective of yourself in relationship to God, that's when your theology starts getting off on the right foot. David says you can enjoy and experience Yahweh's goodness, but you got to start off on the right foot. Fear Yahweh. Why? Because why do you fear the Lord? Read the Bible. There. I make it bulletproof for you. That's what will tell you why you must fear the Lord. Because he is good, because he is powerful, because he's omnipresent, omniscient. He knows all is around us entirely, holds all things together by his own power. Fear him. Give him glory because he is gracious because he is compassionate and does not remove his loyal, loving kindness from those whom he has called. Experience God's goodness. Verses 11 through 14 give us some real practical advice for how we can develop evidence that we have accepted his invitation, that we are in relationship with him. Verses 11 through 14, I've titled, The Proof is Clear. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of Yahweh. Who is the man who delights in life and loves many days that he may see good? Guard your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Here are a number of, I think, eight different attributes of of ways that we can demonstrate evidence that we have accepted God's invitation, that we're acting on it. I've got an acrostic here. Some of you like those. Uh, This is titled Gladdest, which is a word. I looked it up in the Scrabble dictionary. Gladdest. The first letter in Gladdest is G. Guard your heart and your tongue. Verse 13. Guard your heart and your tongue. Your tongue speaks of what comes out of your heart. Your mouth utters what's in your heart. If you have sewage coming out of your mouth, you have a sewage plant inside you. If you have gracious words seasoned with salt, as it were, if you have life-giving words, there's life inside you. Guard your heart and your tongue. L, the L in Gladys. Listen to God's word, verse 11. Verse 11 goes on. A, accept his teaching. Verse 14 says, D, depart from evil. Verse 14 goes on and says, do good. Verse 12 is an encouragement for others to join. That's the E in Gladys. Verse 14, seek peace diligently. That's the S in Gladys. And finally, T, 
teach others what you have learned. That's what David is doing. That's what verses 11 through 14 are about. Teach others what you have learned. This is not the means by which we are saved. If we do all of these things and we check off every box here and we say, yep, I did that perfectly today, that does not mean that you, that is not the means by which you are saved. Our sin can't be canceled out by checking off a list, right? That uh, the sin in our life is so heinous that it can only be paid by the blood of an infinite God. So this is just evidence that you are acting on what you are hearing. This is evidence that you have experienced the goodness of God, that you want the same things that he wants. He does not want us to be deceitful. He wants us to do good. He wants us to leave evil, to seek peace, to chase it. And thus we are invited to enjoy that. Verses 15 through 18 is titled, Yahweh knows those who are his. The eyes of Yahweh are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of Yahweh is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and Yahweh hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Yahweh is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Look back at verse 17. Yahweh delivers them out of all their troubles. Count on it, Christian. You will have troubles. In fact, verse 19 goes on to say, many are the evils against the righteous. But Yahweh delivers him out of them all. You are going to have trials. You are going to have hardship. If you don't, something's probably wrong. <laughs> all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will have trials. You will have, have hardship. God is doing you a great favor. You say, Mark, are you kidding me? My world is crumbling apart. God is putting you in a position of incredible need. So you look to him, and when he answers, when he delivers, he gets the credit. That you weren't so bright and magnificent and strong that you muscled it out. That's an American concept. That's a cultural thing. Christian, you are not called to be strong enough. You're not called to be enough. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. That's good. You are in a position of need so that you can understand and cry out to the one who hears and the one who saves. And he will. And he does. And he has. And you know it. And so do I. Taste and see that he is good. He will bring you through. And you, like Charles Spurgeon, will learn to kiss the rocks that the waves, the trials of life have cast you upon. The hardship in our life is in some aspects a great blessing because it strips away our pride and our arrogance and makes us dependent upon him. Yes, there is loss. Yes, there is pain. There is also joy, as he says. And furthermore, uh, that hardship, what is, it, what is it creating within us? An eternal weight of glory. That's a lot of weight. I don't know how much that is. My mind can't comprehend infinite and eternal, but it's a lot. It's a big amount, and I count on him that he is telling me the truth, and that hardship, that trial that makes me go, I can't, I can't, I don't, I, I have not. 
is just storing up in advance glory that I will be able to return to him. Verses 19 through 22 to, to finish this text out. And again, it was a big, long, run-on sentence. David started out in verses 1 through 3, Join with me in praise, verses 4 through 7, because Yahweh hears and saves. You too can experience Yahweh's goodness, verses 8 through 10. And the proof is clear. Yahweh knows those who are his, delivering them from all evil. Verses 19 through 22, delivering them from all evil. Many are the evils against the righteous. Those aren't from God. You need to know that. Sin is in this world, but the Lord is not responsible for sin. People are. Many are the evils against the righteous, but Yahweh delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Yahweh redeems the soul of his slaves, and all all those who take refuge in him will not be condemned. Hmm. I want to I focus on verse 20 here. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Have you heard that before in the Bible? Do you know what that's from? It's from John. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John Jesus' best friend cites this passage as Jesus was lifted up on the cross and died for our sins. This is a prophetic text. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. God did not allow his son to be broken. There was an extent. There was a limit. A limit to the damage that could be done to him. He absolutely bore the weight of all sin ever on the cross. And yet, he was not willing to let his bones be broken. And so it is with us. There's a limit. We could be burned at the stake. There's a limit to what God will allow to happen. And they, the world will not exceed that limit. And he will be sufficient for us until that day. And on that day, when everything is reconciled and the evil are confronted for their wicked deeds, they will be slain. Verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Yahweh redeems the soul of his slaves, and all those who take refuge in him will not be condemned. I take a lot of comfort in that. I know a little bit about my own heart, how rotten it is, and my own sinful state, but I know how perfect Christ is because God's word tells me that he is perfect and holy and righteous and true, and I go to him alone for the righteousness I need. You don't get into heaven without being perfect. I can't get there myself. I need Christ. Christ is offered. And, and what does he say? I was talking about John earlier. My goodness, what does he say? John 6 says, all that the Father, or Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. John 7, oh, let's go on a, a feast here. Jesus says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He wants us. He wants us. John chapter 10, verse 7. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He says later on in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish, ever. 
and no one will snatch them out of my hand. We are secure with Christ. Oh, what great joy is in store for those who have made Christ their hope. And yet, not all will come to him. The invitation is wide, it's blatant, it's obvious. All of creation is declaring the glory of God, his creativity, his majesty, his careful planning, and his compassionate works. His blessings are abundant. There is no excuse within humanity. No one will be able to say, I didn't know. Everybody's accountable for their sin. Let's conclude. Turn to the last page in your Bible, Revelation 21. The invitation is pouring out. Chapter 22 of Revelation. I'll pick it up in verse 10. And he said to me, an angel says to John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy or of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does unrighteousness still do unrighteousness, and the one who is filthy still be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still do righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, the Christ speaks, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the authority to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, sent my angel to bear witness to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, and the spirit through his word, and the bride through his church say, come. And let the one who hears say, come, that's you. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to receive the water of life without cost I bear witness to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the, the, of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who bears witness to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. He is coming. He has invited us to come with him, to experience his goodness, to accept the invitation, to respond to the invitation with a sanctified life, with praise, with exuberant blessings of the Lord. We'll close with the last verse on the last page of the last book of the Bible. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let's stand and I will close in prayer. Oh Lord, how we love Jesus. Thank you from, for saving us from all of our trials. You carry us through. You meet our needs in ways unimaginable. We are not clever enough to think through all the things that you keep in balance. And Lord, we magnify you for your greatness. Thank you for delivering David. Thank you for saving us. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has not tasted and seen, not understood, has heretofore rejected 
your son, I pray that you would grant them the gift of repentance and that they would repent and cling to Christ alone as the only means of salvation. Lord, may we wear on our faces throughout our context the joy that results from an understanding, a true understanding of the magnificent blessing which you have given to us. May all know that we are yours by our speech, by our conduct, by what pours out of our mouth, by our very appearance, Lord. Make us emissaries and evangelists to invite while there is time. It's in Christ's name I pray. Thank you.